Hi everyone! Today we will make a beautiful GUI application that can classify images of animals and vehicles. I'll introduce you to a brand new open source library called TyPy, which will help us design a very stylish interface. Then we will combine it with TensorFlow to tackle all the machine learning stuff and yes, you will see a detailed workflow of how to build your own neural network. Because on this channel, we don't use AI we make AI. So without any further ado, let's roll. So let's unpack our plan for this tutorial. The first step is designing an interface where users who know nothing of Python can upload their own images and interact with our neural network. Then, once our interface is complete, we will create an image processing neural network. And you don't need a fancy computer for that because it even works on my old broken laptop. Then lastly, we will connect our neural network to our application. We will of course test it with images from our personal gallery. So let's begin by downloading the starter files from my GitHub. And the link is as usual in the description. Now inside our starter files, you will find a logo, a placeholder graphic, a wireframe, which is basically our plan for this project, as well as a whole bunch of demo images to play with. Now, in addition, I've included two Jupyter notebooks that will show you how to design and train a basic neural network completely on your own. Then last but not least, I even included a demo neural network in case you'd like to save some time and skip a bunch of steps. Great. Now, first things first, let's navigate to our terminal and let's create a brand new working environment with Ooh. conda create dash n. And in my case, I'm going to call this environment ml underscore env, as in machine learning environment. We will install Python 3.11 in it. Let's give it a run. And we'll then activate our environment with conda activate ml underscore env. Now, once we are inside our environment, we can then install typepy with pip install typepy. And once the installation is complete, we will go ahead and copy the path to our starter files. We will paste it inside our terminal following a CD command as in change directory. And beautiful. Now we can start coding. For this, we will open our IDE, or in my case, a code editor named Brackets. And let's quickly see how a basic TyPy interface works, starting with the imports. So from typepy.gui, we will import GUI with a capital G. And we might as well save it as a Python file. We will call it classifier.py. Beautiful. Then right below, we will create a GUI instance followed by an empty set of round brackets and we will assign it to a variable named app. Then right below, if name equals main, we will then call app.run. Now, a cool trick is to pass the use underscore reloader argument into run and set it to true. That way, we will not need to rerun our app from the terminal every time we make little changes to our code. So let's quickly save our file. Let's navigate to our terminal and let's run it with Python classifier.py, which will open a browser window with an empty TyPy application on port 5000 of our local machine. And as you may guess, we are dealing with a web application. So how exactly do we add elements to our window? Well, first of all, we will need a web page. So right below our imports, we will create a new variable named index, and we will assign it to a string with an HTML heading one element, also known as h1, with the heading text of hello from Python. Now, once we have a web page, we can then specify it inside our GUI instance with page equals index. Great. Now let's save this file. Let's navigate to our browser. Let's refresh our page and beautiful. Here's our lovely heading. Now, mind you, we did not need to rerun our app from the terminal with Python classifier.py. We simply clicked refresh and our changes were updated. That's all thanks to this use reloader equals true argument. Yay. Now, the cool thing about TyPy is that it's not really limited to HTML only. If we wanted to, we can actually specify some markdown syntax instead. So let's quickly get rid of those tags. We will replace them with a hashtag and a space in front of the heading text. If we save our file now, let's refresh it and we get 
the same result. But the real purpose of TyPy is way beyond some HTML or markdown elements. It is mainly focused on much more powerful control components that come with both front-end and back-end properties. So let's see a quick example to show you what I mean. So let's go ahead and revise our index string first by turning it into a multiliner with a set of triple quotes. And inside those quotes, we will create an image control component with a set of angle brackets followed by a set of vertical bars, and inside them, we will specify the type of image. Then in front of our type, inside an additional set of vertical bars, we will associate a Python variable with our image. And mind you, we haven't defined this variable yet, but we will do it right away. Now, the way to specify variables with typey is in a set of curly brackets that contain the variable name. In my case, I'll call it image underscore path. And then right above our index, we'll go ahead and define image underscore path, and we'll set it to a string of logo.png. Awesome. Now let's quickly save this file. Let's navigate back to our browser window. Let's refresh it. And boom, here's our lovely, lovely image. Now, another cool thing we can do is styling our control components with Python. So let's quickly try to center this image on the page. And back in our code, we'll simply wrap our image control component in an additional set of angle brackets that begin with an additional set of vertical bars. And inside them, we will specify the constraint of text dash center. Ha, let's save this file and boom, here's our lovely centered logo. Next, we will need to choose a file from our system using the file selector control component. For this, we will quickly copy our image control and we will paste it right below. Then we will change the type of image to the type of file underscore selector. And we'll also change the associated variable from image path to content, where content represents the file that we will upload in the future. Now, to make sure that our application doesn't complain, we will go ahead and create a placeholder variable of content, and we will assign it to an empty string. Otherwise, we'll get a bunch of warnings in our terminal. Now, if we're already here, we might as well add some instructions right beside our file selector. To do so, we will add some text. And the way to add text in TyPy is simply by typing it. So in my case, select an image from your file system. All right? Easy peasy. Let's save it and let's refresh our web page. And beautiful. Here's our new lovely components. And let's quickly click on this file selector. Let's then choose all files rather than costume files. And let's select one of our demo images. Ha, there you go. Our image was uploaded successfully given this lovely notification at the bottom. Now, another thing you may notice is that our text and our file selector were placed on the exact same line while our image was placed on a separate line. So let's see what's going on here. Now, back in our code, you will notice that after our image control, we've added a line break, while in between our text and our file selector, there are no line breaks at all. Now, the last two elements left on the wireframe is the image that we upload using our file selector, as well as a temperature indicator, where the indicator basically tells us how confident our model is every time it makes a guess. So I am 80% confident that this is a cat, and I'm 50% confident that this is a ship, and so on and so on. So let's quickly implement it. Now we already know how to make images. We'll just copy our previous one. We will then paste it at the very bottom of the web page. And actually, let's quickly refactor it because our logo is not going to change. So there's really no point, you know, in storing it in a variable. Variables vary, our logo does not. So on the top image, we will replace the image path portion of the variable with a string of logo.png. Then for the bottom image, because it is going to change every time we upload a new file, we can just keep this image path variable on and we can set it initially to placeholder underscore image dot png. And then we will just update it as we go. Okay, so first let's save it. Let's make sure we didn't mess anything up. And beautiful. 
Now let's see how we can update it. To update an element, we would usually need a button that is attached to some kind of callback function. But with TyPy, we can actually use an alternative. It is called the onChange function, and just as it sounds, it is activated by changes in the state of our software. Any kind of change. Uploading a new file is just one of them. So let's quickly see how it works. Now, right below our index page, we will go ahead and define our on underscore change function, which takes in a state, a variable name, and a variable value. So altogether, three arguments without the typo. Now, instead of explaining all of them, let's just quickly print them. That way we can see them with our own eyes. So we'll print var name and right beside it var value. Now, this time we don't really have a choice. We will need to rerun our app from the terminal. So let's go ahead and close our current server instance with control C. We will press the up arrow to fetch the most recent terminal command and we will execute it with enter. And then inside our newest tab, we will go ahead and select an image. Sorry guys, once again, we will have to select all files. We're gonna fix it right away, okay? And then as soon as we select a new image, our onChange function will be automatically executed. So as soon as we press open, we can navigate back to our terminal where we see that the variable name is content and the variable value is the path to our image. Yay. And then once content is no longer an empty string, we can then go ahead and replace our placeholder image with the actual image we uploaded. To do so, we will go back to our code and first we will implement a best practice technique where we first add a condition of if var underscore name equals equals a string of content and only then we will update the image. Otherwise, we don't wanna do that. So the way to update our image is with state.image underscore path, which is the name of our variable from earlier, and we will assign it to var underscore value, ha, where state is automatically received by onChange, and then image path was defined earlier and currently is set to placeholder underscore image. Okay, and then var value, of course, we just received it right over here. That's the path to our image. Cool. Now, before I forget, we will need to fix our file extensions problem. So at the end of our file selector component, we will add another vertical bar and inside it, we will specify the extensions property and we will set it to .png. If we now save everything and now hopefully when we press on the file select button, Yay, we no longer need to manually select all files. We can see our PNG images right away. And then if we select one of them, yay, it is being updated on the page. Amazing. Now the last item in our wireframe is a temperature indicator. So let's go ahead and add it before we move on with machine learning. For this, we will go ahead and copy our image control. We will then paste it right below. We will adjust the type of image to the type of indicator. And we will also get rid of this image path variable. We will replace it with, for now, some kind of placeholder. Let's say label goes here. We will, of course, fix it very soon. Then to the very end of this component, we will add the control property of value and we will set it to zero, at least at first. Then we will add another control property called min or minimum, which we will set to zero as well. Then we will also set the max property to 100 because we're dealing with a percentage. And we will not forget to add the vertical bar <laughs> to the end of this expression. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Cool. Now let's save it. Wow, that's a big, <laughs> it's a very big indicator. So let's make sure we restrict it to a nicer width. Back in our code, we will simply add the width property and we will set it to um let's say 25 vw as in vertical width to make our app look extra crisp we will actually copy this width property and we will also apply it on our logo there you go we will paste it here uh, and that way everything will be extra proportional okay let's go ahead and refresh our app and Holy smokes, you guys, our app looks amazing. We can finally move on with the functionality of things, also known as machine learning. For this, we have a bunch of requirements beyond TyPy, which I've prepared in advance in this lovely requirements file. So let's quickly install it with pip install-r requirements 
jupyter.txt. And once the installation is complete, we will open Jupyter Notebook with Jupyter Notebook. And here, you can choose between the very detailed neural network builder that has everything you need to know to perform your own experiments. So it's basically a step-by-step -step breakdown of all the neural network processes, which I highly recommend for beginners. But on my end, I'm going to go for the quick builder instead, and I will explain it as we go. It's the exact same code, just a different level of detail. Now, step one in designing neural networks is loading a data set, which our network will study really, really well in a process called training. Now, in our case, we are loading a data set named CIFAR10 directly from TensorFlow. But what kind of data are we dealing with? Well, CIFAR10 is made out of 60,000 tiny, colorful images that represent 10 classes of animals and vehicles. Each of our images comes with a label, or Y, that represents the type of animal or vehicle we're dealing with. Now, the images themselves are called samples, or X, and each of them is precisely 32 pixels wide by 32 pixels tall. Now, since we are dealing with colorful images, each of them has three color channels. The first one is red, the second one is green, and the last one is blue, as in RGB. Now, in addition, we get 50,000 images to train with, and we put 10,000 images aside for a process called testing, where we evaluate how well our model trained by exposing it to images it has never seen before. So we are basically checking if we did a bunch of learning or if we did a bunch of memorizing, because there's a bit of a gap. Next, we have a process of data reduction, where we take a good look at our samples and labels and see if we can represent them a bit more efficiently. In our case, we used a technique called normalization on our samples, where we take pixel values in the range of 0 to 255 and convert them to values in the range of 0 and 1. That way, our images look exactly the same, but their values are much, much smaller. Now, in the case of our labels, we used a technique called one-hot encoding to convert decimal values to their binary equivalents. Then finally, we create our neural network based on the structure of our data. And that's exactly why our input shape is 32 by 32 pixels and three color channels deep. That's also why the output of our network is 10 classes long. Other than that, you can pretty much customize everything else and you can find all the detailed instructions and rules in the other notebook. And once we have a model, we can then go ahead and train it on our training set, where the number of epochs represents the number of times our model will go over the entire data set. You can, of course, change this number to anything you'd like. Just please remember that more is not necessarily better. I will show you in future tutorials why. Now, after our training is complete, our model will then be automatically saved on our computer as baseline.keras. But how do we know that our model is smart? Well, right below, please make sure that your training accuracy gradually grows with every epoch, while your training loss gradually reduces with every epoch. Otherwise, it means that something is wrong. But if everything is fine, we will then move on with testing, where we end up with an accuracy score. Now, this accuracy score represents how many of our test samples, the 10,000 images that our network has never seen before, so how many of those were correctly classified. And generally speaking, a good number is anywhere above 65%. If you can reach those numbers, then congratulations. You have just costumized your very own neural network. We can now move on with combining it with our application. Now, to make it work from TensorFlow, dot keras we will import models and then right below we will load the model we just trained with models dot load underscore model to which we will pass our name in my case baseline underscore maria dot keras lastly we will assign this expression to model now to use our model we will go ahead and define a predict underscore image function that takes in a model as well as a path to image 
Now, initially, let's just make sure that our model was properly loaded. So let's go ahead and print model.summary and an empty set of round brackets. We might as well print the path to image just to be polite. Now let's quickly go ahead and call our predict image function inside the on change event. So at the end of our conditional statement, we will type predict underscore image. We will pass our model as well as var value. Now let's quickly comment this uh, print statement that we had from earlier because it's going to confuse us a bit. Let's navigate to our terminal and we will type Python classifier.py. Now let's load one of our images the usual suspect. Let's have a look in a terminal. And yay, here's our lovely model summary. We have officially connected our machine learning elements with our graphic interface. Next, we will need to convert this path into an actual image. For this, we will import a library called pillow with from pill import image with a capital I. Then inside predict image, we will type image dot open to which we will pass the path to image. We'll then assign this expression to IMG, just so we don't get confused. Now, because we might get images in all kinds of color formats, let's make sure we convert all of them to RGB. We can do this with IMG dot convert to which we will pass a string of RGB. We will then reassign it back to IMG. Now, because our training images were all 32 pixels by 32 pixels, we will also need to resize our images with img.resize, to which we will pass a tuple of 32 by 32. We will then assign it back to image, img. But we cannot load it into our neural network just yet because we haven't normalized it. Our pixel values are still between 0 and 255 instead of 0 and 1. Now let's see a clever trick of how we can fix it. For this, we will need NumPy. So let's first import it with import NumPy as NP. Then we will convert our image into a NumPy array with NP dot as array to which we will pass IMG and we will then assign this expression to data because it is not an image anymore. It is something called tensor. Now, once our data is in a tensor form, we can then go ahead and divide it by 255. Let's reassign it back to data and boom, this is how we normalize our images. Now let's quickly print a before and after just to make sure we didn't mess anything up. Okay, so before we'll print data in the index of zero followed by another index of zero. That way we are basically printing the color of the very first pixel. We'll do the same for the after. Okay, we only care about one pixel. We don't care about the entire image. Let's save everything. Um, and actually, before we run you know, our app once again, let's make sure that this image that we just manipulated is actually compatible with our network. For this, we will type um, model.predict and we will pass data into it. Okay, we can then assign it to mm, props as in probabilities. Let's save everything and let's select another image. Let's go for the one with the white background. Let's open it. Let's look in our terminal and ugh. okay, let's ignore this error. <laughs> we'll get back to it shortly. And there you go. Pixel values of 255 were successfully converted to values of one. Yay. Now let's tackle the nasty error. Okay. It seems like we have some issues with the shape of our data. In fact, we are missing an entire dimension. Now, the reason why we got this error is because our model expects a very long list of samples, not just one, but 50,000 or 10,000 of them. So let me show you how to trick our neural network to process a single image. And it's a bit embarrassing. I'm warning you in advance, but it works. So we will do it, okay? Now, instead of simply specifying our data inside predict, we will first wrap it in a list which we will wrap in a NumPy array with np.array. Then lastly, we will focus on all the items until the item at index one in this array. And if you think that it's the same as specifying zero, boy, oh boy, you'll be surprised. Okay, now let's double check that we didn't mess anything up. Let's go ahead and print our entire list of probabilities with probs which is basically a list of 10 items, one for each class. And if we're already here, 
we might as well print the top probability with probs dot max and an empty set of round brackets. And also, okay, let's also print the class to which this top probability belongs. We'll do it with np dot arg max to which we will pass probs. Okay, let's save it and let's give it a quick run. Now let's load one of our demo images. Let's go for this giant boat. Let's navigate to our terminal. And there you go. Now probs returns what we call a class membership probability. So what are the chances that our image belongs to each class? Where this is the chance that our image is an airplane and this is the chance that our image is a car and so on and so on. Now the top probability represents how confident our model is that our image belongs to the class of eight. In our case, we are talking about 85%, which is pretty confident. But the only problem is the class of eight doesn't really mean a boat. But if we navigate to our Jupyter notebook, we can see that the digit eight represents the class of ship. Bravo. Now let's make sure we display it on the interface rather than on the terminal. So first we will copy our class names dictionary from our notebook and we will paste it at the very top of our code. Then inside our predict image function, we can finally get rid of most of our print statements, except the last two, which we will turn into variables. So probs.max turns into top underscore probe, and then our argmax command turns into top underscore pred as in prediction. Now, since we are not really interested in the class number, we are much more interested in the class name. We will wrap our argmax command in a set of square brackets, and we will specify it as a key to our class names dictionary. Okay. And that way the key of eight will return the value of ship. Hmm. Now, once we are done with our function, we will go ahead and return both the top pred sorry, top probe is first and the top pred, which means that we will need to copy these two variables and we will unpack our function call into the exact same variable names. And great, we are officially done with predict image. Now we need to display those values on our GUI. For this, we will need two new placeholder variables. Okay, we will assign them right below our image path. So the first variable is probe. And since it is a number, we will assign it to zero. And as you may guess, the second one is pred, which is a name. So we will assign it to an empty string. Now, since probe returns how confident our model is whenever it makes a guess, we can safely specify it inside our temperature indicator. First, by replacing our label with the typei variable of probe. And then we will do exactly the same with our value. So instead of zero, we will assign it to the variable of probe. Now, in terms of the class name, we'll display it right above our sample image inside a new text control, which we will create with a set of angle bars, then a set of vertical bars, and inside them, the variable of pred. And great. Now, the only thing left to do is updating those lovely typei variables inside our onChange function. So at the very bottom of our function, we will say state.probe, which we will assign to top underscore probe. But the only problem is when we look at our top probe, we see that it's a decimal number. It's not exactly a percentage. So let's quickly convert it to a percentage by multiplying it by 100. Now, since we'd like to get a whole number, we will also wrap it inside a round function. And lastly, we will assign the state.pred to a string of this is a, to which we will concatenate our top pred. Nice. Actually, almost nice. Now, since I really like everything nice and neat, we will also copy our image path state change. We will paste it at the very bottom. And now all our state changes are specified together. Now let's quickly save everything and whew, let's see if it worked. And let's try an image of a dog and beautiful. Our model agrees with 90% confidence. The only problem is I forgot to add a line break. So let's quickly fix it. And this time let's load an image of a cat. And okay, this is a cat, but we are only 47% confident this time, which is not much. 
Now let's quickly see what happens if we are trying to trick our neural network. What if we send it an image of an animal it has never seen before, one that doesn't belong to any of our classes? And I'm of course talking about the elk, which is not a deer, no, but because it has horns, it's close enough, right? So let's open it and boom! Our network recognizes our elk as a deer with 80% confidence. Awesome! And lastly, if you'd like to test my application, it is now live and running on TypeEyes Cloud. You can find the link in the description, of course, and I'm specifically talking about their free hosting option. So if you'd like to do the same for your app, I included all the instructions in the description as well. It is a brand new thing. So if you'd like to see a proper tutorial on it, please let me know. And thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please share it with the world. And don't forget to leave a huge thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos of this kind, you can always subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. I'll see you very soon in another awesome simplified tutorial. In the meanwhile, bye-bye.